World Health Organization says their Nigeria malaria prevention campaign is working. But more still needs to be done. Helping adopted children in transracial families develop their own identities. And a Sudanese American band uses music to tell stories of identity and migration. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory, and this is Africa 54. Now we'll have more of those stories in a moment, but first we begin tonight with Nigeria's war against Islamist militants amid reports of the brutal fighting a stand against the government. And as many as 100 soldiers have been killed by an Islamic State uh, offshoot this week. Now, Lucy Fielder reports. As many as 100 Nigerian soldiers have been killed in the northeast of the country since Sunday, with the finger of blame pointed at an Islamic State offshoot. That information comes from five security sources, all speaking on condition of anonymity. Nigeria's northeast is a restive region, where the government is battling Islamist militants, including Islamic State West Africa and Boko Haram. The administration of President Mohamedou Buhari, who faces an election battle in February, has repeatedly claimed to have won the war against the extremist insurgents. That was refuted by an attack on Sunday in Metele, in Borno State. On Thursday, the Nigerian Senate suspended its session in honor of the 44 soldiers they said had died. Four of the anonymous security sources said around 100 had died in the Metele incident alone, while the fifth said that 96 had died in Metele, but also in other attacks. Military spokesmen did not respond to repeated requests for comment. Well, that report filed by Lucy Fielder of Reuters News Agency. Now, the World Health Organization says a campaign to distribute anti-malaria drugs to children in Nigeria's Bono state appears to be making an impact, uh, with uh, fewer cases now being reported. However, Nigeria is still the world's highest malaria-burdened country, with 25 percent of all cases in the world uh, found in Nigeria. As Timothy Obiezu reports from my uh, there is still far more that needs to be done to control the spread of the disease. When Yakura, Ibrahim's four-year-old son, in early November came down with a fever, she promptly took him for the hospital. The doctor said it was malaria and gave him medications, but for days there was no improvement. About 8 p.m. one evening, my son died. Children and refugees are among the most vulnerable in Nigeria, the worst malaria-affected country in the world, accounting for a quarter of all infections. In Borno State alone, there were over 8,000 new cases of malaria each week in 2017, says the World Health Organization. But WHO malaria consultant Inia Basi Inglas says seasonal efforts to treat over 850,000 under five year olds with anti malaria drugs is paying off. WHO is supporting Bruno State's government to reach out to children within this age bracket within the peak transmission period. We actually started in July. And we, are, we ended this November, and we are seeing some good outcomes from that. Although the WHO has yet to conduct an impact assessment, it says fewer cases of malaria are being reported this year at clinics. But while malaria deaths are being reduced, stopping the mosquito spread disease is still a challenge, says health worker Garba Yusuf. Even though we use the campaign, normally we use almost four times in a year. But there is still a lot of cases of anti uh, of, a lot of cases of malaria. Still, there is cases of malaria. The current campaign is not reaching Nigerians displaced by Boko Haram militants and living in camps, and more efforts are needed to clean up stagnant water where mosquitoes breed to reduce the spread of malaria and protect the most vulnerable. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Meiduguri. 
Well, in other health news, 13 cases of new of uh, Ebola were confirmed on Wednesday in the Northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, according to the Ministry of Health, it is one of the highest daily counts since the start of the outbreak in July. The number of new Ebola cases has accelerated in the past month. An emergency committee of the World Health Organization experts said in October that the outbreak was likely to worsen significantly unless the response was stepped up. Uh, treatment, vaccination programs and safe burials of victims have been disrupted by a surge in violence and local mistrust of health directives. A week ago, 12 Congolese soldiers were killed alongside seven UN peacekeepers in clashes with militias near the epicenter of the outbreak. Well, uh, Zim, uh, rather Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangagwa hopes to revive his country's economy by reorganizing or privatizing state-owned companies so they stop using tax dollars. Columbus Mavunga reports from Bulawayo, where National Railways of Zimbabwe continues to take tax money despite several government cash infusions. Some industries have closed in recent years in the industrial hub of Blawayo, Zimbabwe's second largest city. Launching the transitional stabilization program last month, President Emerson Munangagwa said most state-owned companies that provide services such as electricity, water and transport are failing. Companies such as the National Railways of Zimbabwe have to up their game and transport goods and passengers effectively, said Munangagwa. The rail company is more than $3 million in debt despite several cash injections from taxpayers. Yota Mnue retires next year from the state-owned company after nearly 40 years of service. He is not concerned about its losses. He just wants the government to continue to take care of him. To me, National Railways is everything. Just because I'm who I am, just because of NRZ. It is a, a, an organization I would like to see grow. Even if when I'm, I'm, I'm out there on pension, I would like to hear the sound of the train. It's the pillar of the economy of the country. And so, as a result, it should always remain in the state. But independent economist John Robertson says all companies that serve the government should be privatized if they are to run efficiently. He says the companies have become havens for political patronage. The important thing was to get the job, not to do the job. So we began to find this as a place where high costs were incurred, but very low levels of efficiency and service delivery. These are all service sectors, and they need to deliver services. And if they can't, they should be changed so that the service delivery can resume. Robertson says whoever buys the state-owned companies should also take on the debt load. National Railways of Zimbabwe says it needs a cash injection of $400 million and in six years' time it should start making profits. The organization blames old equipment, some as old as 100 years, and mismanagement by the old administration for NRZ's losses. At one time we used to have over 300 locomotives, but now they are below 100. So definitely uh, we need recapitalization to ensure that we, we, we revive our system, we revive our equipment. The government cannot let go such a, a link or an enabler uh, by privatizing it. We may end up uh, uh, losing the critical issues, especially if we, we have uh, a, a dishonest private player who comes and take, takes it on. Whether it is total privatization or recapitalization, most Zimbabweans hope new rail cars can be put on the tracks to deliver goods and passengers effectively, and Zimbabwe can be on the move, as the organization's motto says. Columbus Mavunga, VOA News. Well, still in the region, as many as 3 million Malawians are expected to face food shortages because of drought and pests. Uh, to address the problem, Malawi and the United Nations are piloting a joint project to assess the health of crops using drones. Lamek Masina reports from Kasungu in central Malawi. The past three years, drought and army worms have destroyed crops for many Malawian farmers and led to food shortages. Farmer Fastoni Mwale in Kasungu district 
is struggling to feed his family of eight children. Income he earns from livestock, he says, is too low compared to what he used to make from growing corn. Over the years, the yields have been declining tremendously. This year, I have just harvested six bags, and I have even failed to send my child to college because I don't have money to pay for it. But food insecurity for Mari's family may be coming to an end after a United Nations project convinced them to switch to irrigation farming. With a drone for crop health project analyzes data collected by drones to determine the best crops suitable for certain areas and the required irrigation. Now we're able to plant three times a year, while in the rain-fed agriculture we were only able to plant and harvest once a year. Maria Jose Torres is resident coordinator for the UN Development Program. What we are trying to do here is actually making data available real-time also to the farmer, so they can know whether or not they should be uh, stopping doing some of the practices, intervene with pesticide or the natural biological systems, see if they have to start preparing for the dry season and therefore changing the type of crops. The UN's Children Fund set up an air corridor for drones in Kasungu last year for use in humanitarian missions. It's hoped the Drone for Crop Health project will help make Malawian farmers more resilient. Ulamek Masina for VOA News, Kasungu, Central Malawi. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, adoption in black and white. But first... Bentu. Arabic, it is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct. And adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. Well, in Friday's finale episode of our five-part series on adoption, Angela Tucker says she felt incomplete growing up, even amid a big family with other siblings, some white, some black, and adopted just like her. That changed after she found her birth mother at age 26. She says, the discovery helped me feel more whole. At the Seattle Adoption Agency where she works, Angela has started a mentorship program to help young adoptees build their own strong identities. Viewers Claire Morangibo reports, narrated by Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. Part of my life is like a mystery to me. One minute I was born and I was with one family and the next minute I was with a different one. At nine years old, Maggie has already thought deeply about her adoption and questions where she belongs. She is the middle child of Amy and Brett Bowton Mead. They have two biological daughters, Sophia, who is 16, and Julia, who is eight. Adopting a child of color has another layer of complexity. I have felt like I can't be, I can't do enough or be enough, or I'm not the right person for her. Like, what was I thinking <laughs> that I could do this? How could I be so arrogant to think I could like, you know, fulfill this role for her? Everyone is looking to figure out who they are. It's about, it's about one's identity. And I think for adopted kids, and particularly 
um, transracially adopted kids. They have to continually work through their stories. Okay, so when yeah, Maggie began so to express questions about her identity, Brett and Amy looked for guidance. They met Angela Tucker, who works at Amara, the Seattle adoption agency where she directs post-adoption services. She made a documentary about searching for her own biological parents. Finding my birth mom has helped me feel more whole. And then just seeing someone who looked just like me, my birth dad, that was crazy. In 2010, Angela met both of her birth parents. She began to talk to and text them regularly. She tried to have deep conversations with Deborah, her birth mother. To be with you is a joy. That's a God, that's God's gift to me. Though Angela's quest for her origins caused some anxiety for her adoptive mom, Teresa and her husband supported the search. I felt like maybe meeting her birth mother would kind of replace me. But Angela's interest in it was so deep, became so deep, that it helped me realize how important it was. Angela's quest was easier for David, her adoptive father. I got the joy of raising her from one to, through college. I couldn't, uh, I wasn't going to lose anything. I mean, you know, they're their own people. Children become their own people. And, and because someone else may come into their life as an important person and should, that doesn't have any impact on my relationships. Yeah, I think the search has made her stronger. After doing it, she can help others and is helping others with their searches. Well, the producer of that series, uh, VA's Claire Morin Jibor, now joins me to tell us more about what she thought is the key takeaway from the interracial adoption series, as well as her personal experience as a parent. Welcome. Once Thank again. you, Vincent, yes. for having me So now looking at this series, uh, through the, the, the five pieces, uh, someone may get a little scared. It may look like, uh, you know, the adoption is perhaps a terrible idea. What would you say? It's definitely not a terrible idea. This is a wonderful idea. But you know, Vincent, as a journalist, we focus on the main issue of the black adopted kid in America. Uh, so yes, I have to say that people uh, must think twice. Uh, and no one should underestimate yeah. uh, this additional layer of complexity, mm -hmm. how being black in America is not always simple. But I have to add and I have to really yeah. tell you that for a lot of family, this is first and foremost a great story of love and happiness. And remember that all this kid was yeah. no parents to take care of them finally get to find their forever family. Yeah. Now, we have some pictures on the screen there. Somebody may be wondering, hey. uh, well, in full disclosure, you are actually a this parent of kids from, that you've adopted from different races. Share with us your personal experience. How so, my uh, own experience, our own experience with my husband has been fantastic so far, uh, but uh, much, and much, much easier than what uh, you can see on the, on the series. But you have to remember that we live in DC, in Washington DC, which is a very diverse city. So this changed a lot. And also my kids are my oldest, just turned seven, mm. with, so there is a long way to go. Yeah, I met them before the show, lovely kids, beautiful girls. Now tell us uh, what you think we should take away from the entire series in a few seconds. I, I, I want to remember the bright side, despite all these challenges, uh, this family can serve as a role model for the, for the society. Uh, it shows that com community can blend together, that we can live together, and what, it, what the best way to yeah. fight racism yeah. in the society. Yeah. So we're not saying it's a bad idea, we're just saying we have to face some realities, yeah? Correct. Tough realities. Yes. But uh, all the same, this creates really beautiful families, amazing families. And mm -hmm. congratulations for having such a blended family, beautiful family. And thanks Thank a lot for the series. And from now, at least I don't have to mention your second name. I'll just be calling you Claire. Easy. Thank you very much. Well, that's uh, VOA's Claire Morin Gibault.
Four and here's what's trending. The annual Black Friday shopping spree marked by deep discounts is underway in the United States. Black Friday traditionally follows the Thanksgiving holiday season, but in recent years it has started on Thanksgiving Day. Now this year, more than half of the U.S. people are expected to visit both brick and mortar and online stores to find deals. The U.S. National Retail Federation estimated that an average shopper will spend over $1,000 during the holiday season this year, which would continue contribute around $720 billion to the U.S. retail industry. Analysts say the option to buy online and pick up in stores has become extremely popular this year. Well, meanwhile, in London, Christ, uh, Christmas is coming and Britons are indulging in Christmas food and drink despite fears about Brexit. At the Christmas Eat and Drink Festival, traditional fair and festive tipples are drawing the crowds in the face of raising, rising costs. Attendees with a sweet tooth cap uh, can drool over festive dessert, uh, desserts from giant sized gingerbread houses to cakes shaped like the Nutcracker and, and Grinch. Cocktails are on the festive menu, with the mixologist adding ingredients like honey, fruit, and flowers to a range of drinks. For those who prefer soft drinks, there are delicious non alcoholic mocktails finished with a biodegradable paper uh, straw. And that's what's trending today. Well, even though they don't figure much in the often contentious debate on American immigration, numbers are showing that the African diaspora community in North America continues to grow and thrive. Many of the immigrants come from varying social and economic backgrounds, and as they resettle in the global north, they carry with them stories of their culture, values, knowledge, and experience. In our Music Maker segment, Viewers Jackson Vunganyu reports on a dynamic Sudanese-American band that is using their music to tell the stories of migration and identity. Studies show that in the last two decades, the African diaspora in North America has continuously grown in numbers, uh, making up almost 5% of the overall foreign-born black population here in, in America. We also see that as Africans travel and settle in the global north, they carry with them stories of their journeys and life, often embedded in the various cultural expressions like the food they eat, the clothes they wear, and many other things. But nothing quite expresses the history of movement and displacement, or for that matter, bears witness to the experience of migrants like their music. Music is passed down from one generation to the other. It's also often the primary conduit in which they carry or preserve their stories. We perform what I like to call Sudanese and Nubian inspired East African retro pop. Al Sarah was born in Sudan and she was forced to flee as a child. Her parents were persecuted for their political activism and had to leave their country of birth. Of Nubian heritage, Al Sarah's music invokes a deep sense of nostalgia about the lands and stories of her people, addressing issues of transnationalism and identity. Home is a concept as fluid as you are as a person. It's one of those things, um, to me, it's just, it's a place where you feel completely like yourself, where you feel no need to impress anyone or anything. And it's a place where you really feel seen and witnessed, um, just like you are, flaws and everything. No need to be exceptional or impress anybody. So it's almost like a state of mind, actually. <laughs> traditional music from in general is old pop so everything comes from tradition my body though happens to be the intersection of a lot of politics um, according to other people so um, we I end up talking about my movement and and people trying to stop it but not in such a direct way 
Because to me, life is like a journey. It's like a sea. It's a migration and movement, and and how that and since that is really the birth of my identity, how does that? How do I see that reflected everywhere around me, especially when I know it's the norm? Um, moving is the norm. In their sophomore album, Manara. The Nubatons explore, among others, the complexities of identity and homeland. And for me, the songs of return are songs of diaspora within home, first displacement, you know? And so to see that a whole body of work had already come to be, that is really about documenting the phases of missing, the phases of longing, the phases of wanting to return to a home that doesn't exist, either because it's no longer there or you're no longer the same, whichever it is. For me, it was a really soothing thing because it was all of a sudden you didn't feel as alone in this experience. I'm like, it's, this is an experience that even my ancestors went through. It's not, it's not new. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, it releases you from the trauma of it. Because it doesn't feel as something that's just happening to you. You're like, oh, it's happened to other people. Let's look for lessons. <laughs> it makes it dual. And that's the important part to me, mostly of just seeing, of knowing history, of knowing other people's stories. That it's just that you're not alone. That it's happened to other people. Mm -hmm. That's important. For many Africans in the diaspora, music is a powerful tool for them as they interrogate their new spaces and initiate a dialogue with other cultures. Uh, but most importantly, uh, through artists like Alsara and her band, The New Buttons, we can begin to understand the cross-cultural interfaces between migration and music. For Voice of America, I'm Jackson Vungani. Now this is cool, the latest entry into the market for super tiny cars that can fit into super tiny parking spaces may come from Israel with a car that, that is right, can shrink its wheelbase to about uh, the width of a motorcycle. Shrink its wheelbase, that is, to about the width of a motorcycle. The global market for electric cars like this is rapidly expanding. The trend suggests the appetite for compact cars may be slowing, particularly in North America. So where will this car fit in? Well, stay tuned. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewerafrica.com. For more news, tune in to Viewer's Evening Radio Show Africa News tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings, today break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night, great weekend. Welcome to English in a Minute. This expression sounds like a violent way of eating, but it's actually not always about eating. Here is your Russian book, Anna. Thanks for letting me borrow it. Oh, are you done with level one already? Yeah, I finished last week, and I've already finished level two. Wow, you are really sinking your teeth into learning Russian. Whoa.